Yeah, so hello everyone. Yeah, thank you guys all for joining. I'm definitely excited for the talk today. Uh, here we have uh, Mr. Louis Maduro uh, presenting on a very important topic in, in radiation therapy, uh, small field dosimetry. Uh, he is from Christiana Care, uh, which is associated with Thomas Jefferson University. And yeah, let's, let's welcome uh, Mr. Maduro for his lecture today. Yep. Thank you, Joe. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Right. Yeah. So um, my name is Luis Maduro. I am a second year medical physics resident here at um, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital um, Medical Physics Residency Program. I am located at the Christiana Care Helena Graham Cancer Center um, site in North Delaware. And um, I'm going to be talking about small field dosimetry today. The latest um, document or code of practice or protocol on this topic is um, TRS-483, where TRS stands for um, Technical Report Series um, from the, um, this, this document came from a collaboration between the American Association of Physicists and Medicine and the AAPM and the International Atomic Energy Agency. And this document was released and um, was published in 2017. And and it's a result of a collaboration between these two um, institutions, um, if you can call them that. Um, though the foundations for this work um, was back in 2007, 2008, um, from Professor uh, Pedro Andreu and Alfonso Laguardia and their thesis group um, in Vienna, Austria. And it wasn't until 10 years later in 2017 where, where, where it was put together as a, as a code of practice um, for us to see. Um, so there is a summary of this from this document from the AAPM, and this is TG155. They provide very good outlines and descriptions as to the whole physics of um, small field dosimetry. They spend a great deal of time talking about detectors. Um, and it, it's a great summary, um, though TRS-483, of course, goes in great depth into every single component of this, okay? They spend, um, they devoted a full chapter on reference dosimetry, which is chapter five, and relative dosimetry. It's all devoted to um, um, chapter six is devoted to relative dosimetry, chapter five reference dosimetry. And the information I gather from this presentation is all from these two documents, primarily from TRS-483. Um, and I'm just gonna walk you through the physics behind it. Um, we're gonna go in depth to some extent about every single dosimetric limitation inherent in small field dosimetry. And, and then I'm gonna walk you through some examples on, on how to actually, you would do this clinically. I won't go deep into um, the advantages and disadvantages of, of detectors because we have so many nowadays that this will be a two or three hour presentation. Um, but I will give you some key points that, that you wanna think about when selecting the right detector for you, depending on the measurements you're, you're doing. Okay, so without further ado, let's just jump right into it. So let's talk about reference dosimetry first, right? So when we do reference dosimetry for photon beams, right? We're calculating the dose from our clinical photon beam 10 by 10 square field conventionally. And we're using the equation here displayed as equation one, okay? And the reason why this is reference dosimetry is because of this term here on the right shown as NDW cobalt 60, right? This term is known as the absorbed dose to water calibration factor. And um, the way this term is established at the standard labs here in the United States, the acronym for standard lab is um, ADCL or NEST, NEST being the primary one, everything here is traceable to NEST. And the way they establish this quantity at the standard labs, um, they know the dose very precisely um, in a water tank from a cobalt 60 beam, right? From a 10 by 10 square cobalt 60 beam. And they place our detector on that location where they know, know the dose precisely. 
And they know the dose there via colorimetry and under well-respected standard conditions. So they place our detector there and irradiate it with a cobalt 60 beam 10 by 10 square field. And they collect a charge from that exposure, from that irradiation, right? The ratio of the dose at that location to the charge collected by our detector is the absorbed dose to water calibration factor unique to that detector, right? Then they stamp this NDW on the case of the detector and they ship it to us. We get in our clinic, right? We set up our water tank in our, in our, in our clinic and we set up our reference conventional 10 by 10 square photon field. And we place our detector along the central axis of the beam at a reference depth is usually 10 cm. And we irradiate our detector in our clinic, right? We collect a reading from it. And of course, we correct this reading for ion recombination, polarity effects, environmental conditions that we all know about. And that charge is represented here on equation one as M, right? Then we plug that M into this equation. We look up the absorbed dose water calibration factor from the case of the detector. And this KQ factor accounts for the fact that the absorbed dose water calibration factor from the was acquired with a cobalt 60 beam. While the charge we plug it in to the left of that KQ is acquired at in our clinical beam, right? So it accounts for the difference in the detector response from being irradiated at two different beams, right? Um, so we plug all this into that equation and we get the dose from our clinical field in the water tank in the absence of the detector, right? Um, but something critical here is that this reference beam has to be 10 by 10 and have to be a flat beam, right? To So that we are able to directly apply the absorbed dose to water calibration factor and KQ you see here in equation one directly to that charge, okay? And this brings me to the challenge in doing reference of symmetry for small fields, right? When we're talking about... Um, machines that only deal with small fields, many times these machines cannot establish a 10 by 10 square field, okay? So in the case of CyberKnife, the largest field um, is a circular field of 60 millimeters in diameter, and it's a six FFF beam, right? So it's not flat. And in the case of gamma knife, there are, there are gamma knives that the largest field is a circular field, 16 millimeters, or the gamma knives um, has, have a, um, circular field of 18 millimeters, right? And I included tomotherapy here, not necessarily because you have to treat um, with small fields in a tomotherapy machine, but I just wanted to list it as another example of a machine for which the conventional 10 by 10 reference field is not is not achievable. You can't set it up on a tomotherapy machine. I think the reference field is a rectangle of five centimeters by 10 centimeters, right? So, so that means that equation one, as we discussed it on the previous slide, cannot be used as it is for reference dosimetry because we are not able to achieve the geometry required for the direct application of that equation, right? So the solution they came up with in the literature excuse me, they said, okay, so for those machines for which the 10 by 10 is not attainable, let's come up with a machine specific reference field unique for those machines, right? And that means that, and, and that will be the largest field attainable possible with those machines. So in the case of CyberKnife, the machine specific reference field would be that 60 millimeter circular field and the same for the other machines, right? And the issue with this is that we need to, we cannot apply the absorbed dose to water calibration factor discussed earlier directly to this reference field. Because as I mentioned, the direct application of it and the KQ, the beam quality correction factor, depend on the, the reference, your clinical reference field being 10 by 10. So in this case, um, we need different um, beam quality correction factors. And I just put this um, KMSR here in red and bold with the dot, dot, dots, um, just as a placeholder, because it turns out that depending on the situation you're in, 
You may need one of them, you may need two of them. And in an ideal scenario, you set it equal to one, you don't need a single one. We're gonna cover all these three scenarios um, later in the presentation. But basically, the challenge from um, reference of symmetry for small fields is the inability of setting up your conventional 10 by 10 square flat beam. In the case of relatives of symmetry, when we're talking about relatives of symmetry, we are, we are comparing our reading with another reading acquired locally under very similar setup conditions, usually changing only one parameter, right? In the case of output factors, we're taking the ratio of doses um, from a non-reference field um, normalized to the, the dose um, from our reference field, right? So in the case, if you wanna measure the output factor of a five by five square field, you collect a charge from it, and that will be the denominator of this equation. And then you open up your MLCs in a conventional LINAC or, or JAWS a collimator, and you set a 10 by 10 and collect your charge. And then that charge of the 10 by 10 will be the denominator in this function, right? Similarly for PDD and TMR. So in PDD and TMR, we're, we're scanning the central axis of the beam as a function of depth in a water tank and normalizing everything to the dose of D max, right? In the case of profile, files or you know um off axis ratios um we're scanning the beam at the same depth at a given distance at a different distances from the central axis of the beam right the whole point of this is that for relative dosimetry we're 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 taking ratios of doses right and to illustrate how this could be affected in small field dosimetry Let's think about the difference in setup between a TMR and a PDD, right? When we when we are acquiring a TMR, we use an SAD setup, right? In the United States, we call it source to axis distance setup. And I, I emphasize that because I've read literature not from the United States where they, they call it SDD setup, source to detector distance fix. Um, but regardless of how you call it, the whole point of this is that in a TMR, you're still scanning the central axis of the beam as a function of depth, um, but you're moving the couch of the machine to compensate for the motion of the detector so that the distance from the target to the point of measurement is always fixed. So if you're scanning, if you if you're scanning from the surface of the tank to the bottom of the tank, let's say you you lower your detector by one centimeter, just as an example, you would bring the couch up by one centimeter so that the reading one centimeter deeper would, would be only affected by attenuation in the one centimeter of water now above the detector, but keeping the same distance from the target, right? So TMR is not affected by inverse square, but um, only attenuation inside the water tank. And because of this setup, in a TMR, the field size at the point of measurement is always the same. Right now, in the case of a PDD, though, we use an SSD setup, right? So the distance from the target to the surface of the water tank is always the same. You're still scanning the water tank as a function of depth along the central axis of the beam. And that means that if the, if the, the distance from the target to the surface of the water tank is maintained fixed for every measurement, that means that if you're scanning from the surface of the tank to the bottom of the tank, you're moving away from the target. And vice versa, if you're scanning from the bottom, you're moving closer towards the target as you make your measurements, right? So because of this setup, the field size at the point of measurement on a PDD is always changing, okay? And we never talk about how the different field sizes at the point of measurement on a PDD affects your reading. Like we don't talk about this in school and like I haven't heard it in, in residency unless when you study small field dosimetry. And, and I think the reason for that is because any dosimetric influences emerging from the different field sizes on a PDD are either negligible or the way they are affected at a given depth affect the reading in the same way at a lower depth. And then when you plug the two charges on here in equation three, this influences will cancel each other out. And the reason for that is because these are non-small fields, right? When you do PDD for non-small fields, this is not an issue you're concerned about. But I would ask you for a second now to think about 
setting up on a conventional linear, let's, let's say you set up a two by two centimeter square field, right? That means that at 100 centimeters from the target, you're going to have a tiny square field of two by two. Now, imagine from that location at the isocenter, two, two by two centimeters squared, imagine coming closer to the target, right? So then the field size at the point of measurement will be ever slightly smaller than two by two due to inverse squared. And, and if you move away from the target, from the isocenter, the field size at the point of measurement is gonna be ever so slightly larger than two by two, right? So any dosimetric limitations emerging from field size are gonna be more pronounced for the field smaller than two by two than the field larger than two by two, right? That's why for small fields, you can't simply just take the ratio of, of charges like we would do for non-small fields because sometimes the reading is affected by the field size significantly different than another one in this ratio, right? The same is the case for output factors. If you think of, you know, measuring the output factor of a one by one centimeter square field. In that case, the denominator on this equation will be the dose measured from your one by one um, centimeter square field. And if we're talking about a conventional LINAC, the denominator of this will be the reading from a your 10 by 10 reference field, right, at the same depth. And, and in that, in such a scenario, the one by one centimeter square field that field size would affect your readings in ways that the denominator of that equation is not affected. That's why you can't just take conventionally um, relative ratios, just like you would do for non-small fields. So the solution they came up with is they say, let's come up with field output correction factors, right? So for small fields, you would need to attach this um, case of clinical MSR to account for the dosimetric limitations affecting your reading, um, your relative ratios, okay? Now, this is of, of uh, critical importance though, because we all know that all this data, PDDs, TMRs, profiles, of axis ratio, ratios, we feed this data into our treatment planning system. We feed this data into our secondary MU calculations over any system that allow us to calculate the dose or verify the dose um, uh, to be delivered to the patients require this data to be fed to them, right? And it, it's very important because it's being documented that the differences, differences up to 15% between corrected and uncorrected relative ratios is being registered for small fields. And, and they talk about this in the literature and it's very important. And, and, and the direction in which we're gonna affect the patient if we leave this relative ratios uncorrected will be overdosing the patient. Because as we will see shortly, the net result of all these inherent limitations in small field dosimetry um, are in an underestimation of the dose, right? So, so that means that the TPS will compensate with a higher output to deliver a given dose because the ratios, the uncorrected ratios were actually lower than the actual output of the machine when measured, right? So this is very important. Um, so just to recap before we define this, when we talk about reference of symmetry, the challenge is not being able to achieve a 10 by 10 flat square field. And when it comes to relative to symmetry, we need to account for the, for the limitations emerging from field size in our relative ratios, okay? So let's define what makes a small, a photon field small. These are the official definitions on TRS-483 and um, TG-155. So the first one reads as there is a loss of lateral charge particle equilibrium, right? So what we got to think about when we read this definition, what I think about when reading this definition, you got to think about if the separation between the edge of your field and the outer edge of your detector, it's smaller than the range, the maximum range of a secondary charge particle in the media, 
then you're in the small field of symmetry realm, okay? And you need to correct for that. And we're going to talk about that in detail on the next slide, right? The second definition says there is a partial occlusion of the primary photon source from the collimating devices, right? And if we take this, um, if we interpret this second definition, like literally, that simply means, imagine having a field, a, a target that is just unrealistically large. Let's say your target is 10 centimeters in diameter, right? If you set a five by five square field with your collimating devices, right? Then from the point of view of the detector, you will be occluding some of the target because the target is larger than the field size you're trying to measure, right? And now I'm emphasizing on the literal interpretation of this definition because for modern Linux, the targets are only about five millimeters in diameter. It's really small, right? And in a conventional Linux, without attaching any anything to the collimator, like literally with the collimator of the machine, we never talk about fields smaller than five millimeters by five millimeters, right? But yet this effect starts affecting our reading, even if we don't include such a tiny target with a conventional Linux. And we're going to see why in a minute. Um, now, the third definition reads, the size of the detector is compatible to the dimensions of the photon field. And this one is also easy to see. If we imagine, let's say, a um, unrealistically large cylindrical chamber, right? Let's say the diameter of our chamber is 10 centimeters in diameter. If we delivered a five by five square field onto that large sensitive volume, then we will be dealing with a small field dosimetry issues, okay? And the dosimetric limitation emerging from this is known as the volume averaging effect, right? So the whole point of this third definition is that the, di the, the very dimensions of the detector you're using to measure your field um, play a role in whether you're dealing with the small field dosimetry limitations or not, right? And that just makes sense. So now let's let's talk about each of these ones in more detail. Um, so I decided to explain the loss of lot charge particle equilibrium starting from this graph here on the left that we are very familiar with, right? So this is this is the relationship between the kinetic energy released in a water tank and the absorbed dose delivered into the water tank, right? From a photon field, right? So here the depth in the water tank is represented by the horizontal axis. So when we're talking about the surface of the tank, we are at the x axis equals zero. And if we imagine for a second about 10 billion electrons just floating in our water tank, right? When they receive that first fluence, the photon fluence, right? This electrons gain a lot of kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy means motion. That means they start traveling down into the, into the water tank really fast, right? And it is for this reason that at the surface, the kinetic energy here represented by Kerma, the dashed um, line, is highest at the surface. And as we know, those secondary electrons or secondary charged particles are the ones depositing those in our water tank. And it is for that reason that water, the absorbed dose at the surface is, is smallest and it starts to increase shortly after the surface, right? And it comes a point where these two, these two quantities, the absorbed dose and the, and the kinetic energy release in the medium, they are the same, they, they have the same value, right? And when this happens, this depth inside the water tank is said to be under charged particle equilibrium. And all that means is if you were to place a tiny sensitive volume at that depth in the water tank, um, the same number of charged particles entering that volume will be the same as the charged particles leaving that volume, right? Now, once we go past this depth, now we're, we're in business as physicists because once we enter the transient charge particle equilibrium zone, which is a little further than, than the point of charge particle equilibrium, um, we can now reliably measure the dose in this region because the kinetic energy released in the water tank and the absorbed dose are proportional to one another. That's what they decrease at the same rate, right? And it is because of this proportionality that we can equate the ratio of dose to 
charge from the COBO-60 beam at the ADCLs to our dose to charge of our clinical beam in our clinic. OK, and the reason for that is because these two quantities are proportional to one another. At the ADCLs, they when they when they establish the absorbed dose water calibration factor, they're also in the transient charge particle equilibrium region in the water time from the COBO-60 beam. And this is where we place our detector in the clinic. It's usually 10 cm, right? And as long as we're in this region, we can reliably calculate the dose because they're proportional, the dose and the collision um, and the kinetic energy release in the meter are proportional to one another, right? Now, something else happens at this depth, at the beginning of transfer charge particle equilibrium that is relevant to explain the loss of lat lat uh, lateral charge particle equilibrium. And this is the depth where the range of the, of the Elect the 10 billion electrons generated at the surface, this is where the maximum range of, range of those electrons end, right? So after all these electrons generated at the surface, after they stop in the water tank, there's not a single one going any further. That's when we enter the transient charge particle equilibrium zone where we can reliably measure the dose. Now, this graph is from TRS-483 and they use it to illustrate the loss of charge particle equilibrium, right? So this is these are um, Monte Carlo simulations. The detector is sitting at 5 cm depth, right? And you're changing um, the field size represented here on the horizontal axis for all these di different energies, photon beams shown above. And here the horizontal axis is the ratio of those to water to the kerma inside the water tank, right? So the detector is not moving, it's sitting 5 cm depth along the central axis of the beam. And you're simply changing the field size. These are circular fields and this is the radius. You're just changing the field size for all these energies and, and measuring this ratio. If we focus on the largest field here, let's say three centimeters, right? For all of these energies, the dose, the ratio of dose to kerma is pretty much the same, or it's higher than one, but they're not for but they're not interested in showing when this ratio is higher than one. The whole point is to show where the um where this balance between dose and kerma starts to um decrease, right? Um so from the three centimeter square field, we can reliably measure the dose of a three, sorry, of a three centimeter radius circular field for all these energies. But if we start analyzing this graph for shorter, smaller fields, in the case of the one centimeter radius circular field, you can see that the ratio of dose to kerma starts becoming less than one for the 24 MV, 15 MV, 10 MV, and the 6 MV, that balance starts to, to be lost, right? So that means that at the same depth for the same energy, when we come from three centimeter radius circular field to a one centimeter radius circular field, collision kerma starts to become larger than those, okay? And this is equivalent as being in the buildup region of, of our graph on the left. Now, I wanna be very careful of how I'm saying this. I'm not implying that there is some type of buildup taking place adjacent to our detector when measuring from small fields. What I'm trying to say is, if you're shrinking your field to a point where the secondary charge particles originated adjacent to your field, do not have enough space to travel to travel a full range before striking the sensitive volume of your detector, then you will be in the small field realm. You, you're dealing with small field dosimetry, right? And 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 in order to account for the dose delivered by those particles traveling laterally, in order to account for that reliably, we need that space. We need the separation of the edge of the detector and the outer edge of your um, of the edge of your field and the outer edge of your detector to be at least a full range of those particles in order to measure the dose reliably, right? If this cannot be accomplished physically because your field is so small, then we need to correct for that. And um, TRS-483 gives you formulas 
where you can calculate based on bean quality, either TPR 1020 or uh, percent that those, where you can actually calculate the radius of your field where charged particle equilibrium will be maintained. Now, the second definition, the partial occlusion effect, as I mentioned earlier, if we take the literal interpretation of this, um, this is from TG155, and here the target is represented by the red triangle on the top, and the collimating devices is represented by the gray blocks, and our sensitive volume is this green blue circle at the bottom, right? So the diagram on the left shows a the measurement of a non-small field, right? As we can see, the primary fluence represented by the area in between the vertical arrows is, is striking our detector evenly, right? The whole We can see the whole target from the point of view of the detector. But when we start shrinking our field size, right? Bringing the collimators closer together, as illustrated on the right, from the point of view of the detector, we're missing some of the target. We cannot see the target in its entirety, right? And also, if we see the primary fluence, we'll be striking our detector only a fraction of the sensitive volume of the detector, right? Now, I said that the, the target from conventional modern Linux is only about five millimeters in diameter. And we don't ever set a field smaller than five millimeters in a conventional Linux with our collimator, right? But but this effect starts, or the, this effect of the partial occlusion effect starts playing a role in our reading before we get to such a tiny fields, um, because the penumbra for small fields gets really large, right? And it gets large to a point that it overlaps with our primary fluence. And since penumbra is scattered radiation, it is a radiation of lower energy than our primary fluence, and therefore it drops our reading, right? So this is a direct um, condition where we will be underestimating the dose that we're reading with our detector. Another consequence of this and this is this is more important when we're modeling the beams in our treatment planning system. This overlap of the penumbra with the primary field results in a larger perceived from the point of view of the detector, a larger full width half max than the actually setting um, of the collimator, right? Than the actual field size set on the collimator. And when modeling a, a profile of a small field, this is something that we have to um, take into account. Now, the third definition says there is a, there is a, there's volume averaging effect, right? This is the way they illustrate this on TRS 483 is, is via this graph, right? So here the sensitive volume is represented by the double headed arrow on the top of the, of the diagram, okay? And the primary, the, the output of the field is represented by the solid Gaussian function. And the, the reading that we get with that irradiation is represented by the dashed Gaussian right below the detector. And the dashed dotted function underneath represents the difference between these two, right? So, so a way to see this, it, it's the reading from an air filled detector, right? Like an ionization chamber, it's is the average charge collected over the entire sensitive volume, right? So your electrometer would, would average the charge collected over the entire sensitive volume, right? For, for cylindrical chambers and for photons, this um, effective point of measurement, we call it, this, this falls at the um, 0.6 RCAV, right? That's what we have to shift our PDDs to get the charge at the effective point of measurement. That mean charge falls at that location of our chamber or cylindrical chamber. And so, so as we can see in this illustration, the primary fluence is only striking the center of our sensitive volume. So the head of the two arrows are outside of this fluence, right? So that means that the contribution to charge on the, this sensitive volume is only from the center part that is irradiated directly by our output, but the heads of it are outside of this and not contributing to charge. Then if, if the electrometer averages the charge collected over the entire sensitive volume, we're going to end up with an underestimation of the actual dose, right? So, so these are the 
three definitions officially and, and the challenges that come for small field dosimetry. So what they came up with in the literature was let's come up with correction factors that allow us that account for all these dosimetry limitations I just covered, right? And as implied, those correction factors depend on energy, they depend on field size, detector size, detector composition also, because this would add a different perturbation to the fluence, right? Usually for, um, for um, fuel output correction factors for relative ratios, um, the correction factors for solid detectors such as silicon diodes um, will be lower than one because they over respond for small fields because their density is um, greater than water and they usually are very tiny. So they suffer less from losses of charge particle equilibrium. In the case of air field detectors, you wanna have a large signal to noise ratio and a, and a large sensitivity, large enough to make a reliable reading. So usually the air field detectors um, have a larger volume um, than solid detectors and therefore they um, under respond to a small field. So the correction factors are usually larger than one, right? But now when you, if you have, let's say two detectors, so you need to do small field asymmetry, a good way to, to choose what detector you would use is the one that shows the correction factor closer to one, right? Now, all these correction factors can be calculated via Monte Carlo calculations or even experimental measurements, and, and a lot of them are on TRS-483. TRS-483 contains a lot of tables with many different correction factors um, as a function of energy, fuel size, and detectors. We're going to see an example um, on the next slide, right? So... Let's assume you have a cyber knife and you want to measure the output factor from a two centimeter circular field, right? And the detector you have for this is the Extradin A14SL microchamber Shunkra Slim line, right? Just as an example, right? So to measure this, you would collect your charge in a water tank or your dose from the two cm circular field, right? That's the output you want to measure. And then you change the cone and set up your machine specific reference field. In this case will be a six millimeter um, circular field and you radiate it, right? So the charge from this machine specific reference field will be, would go in the denominator of this function. And the charge from the collector from the two CM circular field goes in the denominator of this function. And then you come to page 124 on TRS 483 on table 23. And you multiply that relative ratio by this 1.002, okay? And this um, output correction factor would account for the loss of large charge particle equilibrium, the volume averaging effect, and the partial occlusion effect that affected the reading and denominator for the two centimeter square field that did not affect the reading in the denominator of this ratio, which is your machine specific reference field, right? So, so the concept of relative dosimetry for small field is fairly simple. You just have to correct the ratio, the ratio, but the effects are very important because otherwise we will be, as I mentioned before, overdosing the patient. Now, when we're talking about um, reference dosimetry, as I mentioned, there are, there, are, there are different situations where you may need one or two or or not, um, or, or a, a beam quality correction factor equals to one, right? But before we jump into the three scenarios, I like to think of every single one of these correction factors, just like we think of them for the conventional 10 by 10 square field and even for electrons, right? So for the conventional uh, 10 by 10 beam quality correction factor, this factor allows us to apply the absorbed dose to water calibration factor, the cobalt 60 beam, to our clinical beam, right? In the case of electrons, the key KE cal 
would allow us to go from the cobalt 60 beam to our calibration electron field at the ADCLs, right? And K prime R50 would allow us to go from that electron calibration field to our electron clinical field, right? So the way the beam quality correction factors behave in reference symmetry and for small fields um, is pretty much the same, right? So the first scenario that they talk about on TRS-483 is a scenario where you're able to obtain your absorbed dose water calibration factor with your machine specific reference field, right? So this is the least likely of all of them because that means you're calibrating your, your detector with your machine specific reference field, right? In that case, the beam quality correction factor would set equal to one. Um, but in a more realistic situation, right? For example, here, the gamma knife at, at Thomas Jefferson, we have the beam quality correction factor from table 14 on TRS-483 that allow us to apply the absorbed dose to water calibration factor from the cobalt 60 beam directly to our machine specific reference field for the gamma knife, okay? And there we use the a spherical dosimetry phantom, the Lexel gamma knife phantom um, solid water. And we have the extra din um, A1 SL detector. So we measure our charge, correct it for all environmental conditions, iron combination, and so on and so forth. And we have the NDW for that detector. And we simply look up um, the beam quality correction factor that would allow us to bring that absorb dose to water calibration factor and apply it directly to our um, dose equation. So the takeaway from this is when you have, when you're able to obtain a beam quality correction factor to apply your absorb dose water calibration factor directly to your machine specific reference field, then the dose equation for reference dosimetry looks pretty much the same as equation one, um, like displayed here. In the case for the cyber knife at Christiana, though, we don't have a beam quality correction factor that would that would bring us that would allow us to apply the absorbed dose to water calibration factor for the cobalt six beam directly to our our um, machine specific reference field. Okay, so in in that case, the scenario is a little more interesting or more complex, right? Because we have to come up with or measure a, a beam quality correction factor that would, that would allow us to apply the um, absorb dose water calibration factor for the cobalt 6 beam to a hypothetical 10 by 10 square field that if the cyber knife was able to achieve, it will have a given beam quality, right? Believe it or not, they talk about a hypothetical 10 by 10 that is clearly not attainable in your machine because you have a machine specific reference field that, that directly implies that you, you're not able to achieve a 10 by 10. But, but they said, if, if, if you measure this, um, and I'm gonna go through the steps on how to measure that, you come up with a beam quality that if the cyber knife, if your machine specific reference field was able to reproduce, it'll have that beam quality, right? And once you have that, you come up with a another beam quality correction factor that will take you from that hypothetical 10 by 10 to your machine specific reference field, okay? Now, the way this is done is the following, right? The first step is to come up with, calculate the equivalent square field um, for your machine specific reference field, right? So in the case of CyberKnife, the conversion from the circular six millimeter, six centimeter diameter machine specific reference field is not the simple geometric conversion into a square field, okay? Because, and I learned this studying for, um, and doing research on small field asymmetry. The, any equivalent square fuel size that we talk about is a flat beam, okay? And since the um, machine specific reference field for cyber knife is non-flat, then the conversion is not a simple geometrical conversion to go from circular to square. And the reason for that is because for FFF beams, the contribution from scattering at the central axis of the beam is significant, right? And also you need, 
a function that accounts for the variation of profile as a function of radius on a non-flat beam or FFF beam, right? So the way to calculate a equivalent square field from a non-flat um, circular field is via this double integral equation displayed down here. And, and of course, you don't have to calculate that now, right? You have from TRS-483, you get the equivalent square field size of a, gam of a cyber knife. Um, but if you were to calculate this theoretically, you would use this um, double integral down here. And they give you the values for gamma and mu. And the function f of r at the end represents that variation of, of the profile as a function of distance from the central axis of the beam. Now, once you have that equivalent square field, then you would measure your beam quality. You would estimate the beam quality of that equivalent square field for your machine specific reference field, right? And you have the option, you could do a TPR 1020, 2010, right? And, or you would estimate it via your percent dead dose, right? Regardless of which way you choose, once you obtain this beam quality, um, you plug it into the equations below here. And what you get from this is the beam quality of your hypothetical 10 by 10. That is the cyber knife in this example was able to achieve or establish. That will be the beam quality of that hypothetical 10 by 10, right? So if you, if you choose the route of the TPR 1020, you would plug it into um, the second to last equation here. And once, and once you get that beam quality, you just look up the beam quality on TRS-398 like you would on a conventional 10 by 10 reference field. And if you choose to do it via the percent that those, you would plug, you would plug that beam quality into the last equation, and that will give you the percent that those of that hypothetical 10 by 10, that if you were able to achieve on a cyber knife, that would be the beam quality of it. And then you just look it up on TG51 like you would the conventional 10 by 10, right? Now, something I wanna say here, I mentioned two of these, right? I mentioned two beam quality correction factors. If you're able, if you calculate your, the beam quality of the hypothetical 10 by 10, as I just described, then at the end of TRS-483, there is an account of uncertainties that if you're able to measure this beam quality correction factor from a hypothetical 10 by 10, um, the uncertainties are large enough that allows you to set the second beam quality, the one that would and able to apply the absorbed dose to water calibration factor for the hypothetical 10 by 10 to your machine specific reference field, you could set it equal to one, okay? And they, they go into details on this at the end of um, TRS-483, right? And this is how you would do reference dosimetry. So depending on the scenario you're in, if you're able to get a beam quality correction factor, that would allow you to apply your NDW, you just look it up and boom, apply it to your dose equation. But if you don't, you have to go through the serious steps that I just described to measure um, the one you need. Um, now, to keep in mind for detectors, remember the ideal detector will be the one that adds the least perturbation to your fluent, okay? So when you're choosing a detector, you wanna make sure you get the smallest possible that would still give you a reliable measurement. And the detector material, you wanna have it as close as possible to um, water equivalent, to be water equivalent. And the density of your active volume, as I mentioned, the difference between solid detectors and airfield detectors will also play a role in the perturbation. Um, and, and of course, the one that will give you a suitable signal to noise ratio, right? But, but as I mentioned, if you have one or two or three detectors and you don't know which one to choose for your small dosimetry measurements from the tables on TRS-483, you, I would highly advise to choose the one with the correction factor closer to one, right? Because that implies that the way that detector is perturbing your fluences is the least out of the out of the options you have, right? And also, um, 
all these documents down here, 2RS-483, TG-120, ICRU-91, IPM-103, TG-155, they give you guidance on how to select the right detector for small field dosimetry. And uh, these are my references and a lot of rele uh, relevant documents up here for small field dosimetry. And, and I think this is the end. Thank you.